This is Hope Possible Ministries. Welcome to part two of my response to Kerrigan Skelly's series on baptism. We sure do have a lot to cover today. So without further ado, let's get into this. I am glad he begins the teaching in the second video with actual scripture, which is a vast improvement from the first video. I agree with part of what he says in Matthew chapter three. The Holy Spirit baptism from Jesus is greater than the water baptism from John the Baptist. He adds little nudges while reading. Saying water baptism doesn't do anything, it is only symbolic of an inward change. Even though that is not what the scripture is saying, he just adds his own commentary. He then focuses on what John said about fruits meat for repentance. I agree. Although, what does Kerrigan mean when he says fruits of life? Meat for repentance? I know what he means. Kerrigan thinks it means you need to prove you were saved. Which takes how long? Was John the Baptist telling people they had to wait many days? Maybe a month. So he could decide if they were saved before water baptizing them? No. Also when you read about people being water baptized. In the book of Acts, did they wait for people to prove they were saved? Before they were water baptized? No. They were immediately water baptized when they said they believed. And repented, that is what actually happened. Okay then. What does it mean to show fruits worthy of repentance? Humility, confessing your sins, and begging for mercy. These are the fruits of repentance by humbling yourself and crying out for mercy. These are the fruits John was talking about. These are not fruits that takes days or a month to determine. These are fruits that are made apparent right then and there. This is something the Pharisees, which John was rebuking, would have refused to do. They were in their pride. They would never humble themselves and confess sins in front of the people. Matthew chapter 23 verse 12 And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. James chapter 4 verse 6 But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. 1 Peter chapter 5 verses 5 and 6 Likewise, Ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. John the Baptist was simply looking for simple humility. Then when they were confessing sins and repentance, then he would baptize them. He did not set appointments. And schedule for the time for family and friends can be there. He was baptizing people that were there that day. Also who when they are first converted are fully discipled. Anyone. I wasn't. When I was born again. I knew practically nothing. I was a babe in Christ. I still had some bad habits and no idea how to resist temptation properly. How then can I show perfect Christian fruits without being discipled? It just doesn't make sense to expect that from anyone. Later on you will see Kerrigan saying the same thing about himself. When he was born again, he knew nothing. How then can he expect other new converts to do what he himself was unable to do? A person can be humble can't they? They can desire to be forgiven and set free, can't they? These are the fruits meet for repentance, which the Pharisees refused to do. Next Kerrigan goes to Mark chapter 1, verse 4. He also reads Luke chapter 3, verse 3. These are great verses. I am so glad he is reading them. Mark chapter 1, verse 4. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Luke chapter 3 verse 3 And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Let's see if he accepts the clear reading of the verses. 
or if he dances with it to prove his own view. Right off the bat wouldn't you know it. He said quote, Some people will have you to believe that baptism is for the remission of sins. End quote. Can you believe it? He said it out of his own mouth. Isn't that what it plainly says? Then he follows that by saying, quote, Well, that's not how I see it. End quote. Again he defaults to personal opinion then proceeds to lift up that personal opinion as a law for others to follow. What blindness is this? We cannot base our soteriology, which is the doctrine of salvation, upon the opinion of one man. I don't really want his opinion asserted as a law over me. That is how cults get started. It is very dangerous. I can't be any less harsh. This is a severe problem. He continues to assert his preferences and opinions as God's law. Isn't that what the Pharisees and Sadducees did? Sadly it is what many churches do today. When he said quote, some people say end quote, what followed was simply a plain reading of the text. Why can't we just accept the plain reading of the text? Is God able to make his word easily understood? Why do so many teachers think they can help God? To get his points across, God doesn't need my help. For the most part, I just read what it says and allow God's word to speak for itself. I will occasionally look to the source text to get a deeper understanding. I don't try to use the source text to completely change what it simply says. That is what false teachers do. They twist the source text to revert or change the simple reading of the text. That is a huge warning sign to any believer. Do you want to know how you can tell when someone is teaching something false? All you have to do is see whether or not they accept the plain reading or override the plain meaning by using the source text to twist it around. That's how you know. Whenever possible, always accept the plain reading of scripture. Even Kerrigan normally has a little saying, which I agree with. He normally says, quote, if the simple sense makes perfect sense, take no other sense unless you make nonsense. End quote. I agree with that for some reason, on this topic. Kerrigan is violating this saying of his, he's ignoring the simple sense, which makes no sense, and thereby making nonsense, that is exactly what he is doing. Kerrigan is correct in saying, that remission means the same as forgiveness, I agree, it can also mean pardon, forgiveness, or pardon of sins, he does understand this correctly, yet, the problem is him asserting his opinion as God's law. This is the worst thing any teacher can do. This is never, never, never an acceptable thing to do. He ought to know better. This is a major blindness for him to have. I pray his eyes might one day be open to this very grievous error. Kerrigan refuses to accept the simple plain understanding of these passages. For whatever reason this is exactly what he is doing. Sadly it seems Reformed theology has really permeated the church. Throughout the centuries, the majority of Reformed theology is just an antitype to Roman Catholicism. Don't get me wrong. Roman Catholic beliefs are wrong about nearly everything they believe. The answer is not to create polar opposite beliefs. To think by mathematical opposition somehow finds truth. That isn't how the Bible works, what we should do is simply come to scripture with no agenda of our own, except to see what scripture can teach us. Not to wrangle scripture to fit our ideas. For instance, Kerrigan does take some scripture at face value, he does not try to explain them away. Here is an example. Matthew chapter 5 verse 48. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. I am faced with a decision. Do I accept it plainly as written? Do I try to make it say something else? Kerrigan would accept this exactly as written. As would I. Jesus is calling for moral perfection, simply meaning to be free from sin, having all sins past sins forgiven in Christ, and doing all Scripture says to prevent from sinning going forward. What if I decided to treat this like Kerrigan treats the water baptism verses? Many say, and I quote, Well, we all know we can't be perfect. End quote. How many pastors say that? Most of them do. Why? 
Reformed Theology. The same reason Kerrigan attacks water baptism. They use the same tactics Kerrigan uses. Let me demonstrate. Here is a sample of what they do. It goes like this. Some people will read this verse and say, Jesus tells us to be perfect. We all know that is impossible in this life. What Jesus really means is we are to strive for that goal, even though we will never reach it. Jesus knows we can't be perfect. When you look at the Greek word translated as be, you'll see it can also mean shall be or should be. God has a perfect standard that we can never keep. So Jesus is only pointing out God's perfect standard and telling us to just go for it. We should be perfect, but we can't be. That is what Jesus is saying. Jesus is building a tower he knows we cannot climb to humble us. Did you see what I did? I used one little word, went to the Greek, and signed a different meaning. Just enough to change course, just a little. Then filled the rest in with man's words, declaring it as impossible. This is how false teachers work. They know they cannot change the big words in the verse. The Greek for perfect means perfect, which is why even the NIV translates it as perfect. They cannot get around that, so they attack the small connecting words and prepositions, which in Hebrew and Greek can be used in many different ways. Then they bend those words a little, just enough to change direction. Now the verse means the opposite of what it says. Voila! This is what Kerrigan does with water baptism verses. The same tactic. I only hope he realizes it and changes course. Kerrigan concludes his speech on these verses by saying they were baptized by water because they already were confessing their sins and repenting, as if this means the water does nothing. The problem with that should be obvious. First of all, it is a straw man argument to suggest those like me and why City Fellowship actually believe that water baptism is done so we can repent and confess sins. Why is that a straw man argument? It is because we actually believe water baptism must follow repentance and confession of sins. Without that, the water does nothing. It is not a proper water baptism unless there is repentance and confession of sins beforehand. Only then can it be for the remission of sins. The second problem is the same thing I brought up in the first video. He is ignoring the elephant in the room. If they were repentant and confessing of sin. Also if the water does nothing of its own. Why even get baptized? They were under the old covenant. Water baptism is not part of the old covenant. What they should have done is go to the temple and give their sin sacrifice not get baptized. Remember at this point in time Jesus had not given the command to baptize. So what purpose did it have to compel the people to need water baptized by John? If it was nothing it reduces what John was doing to a gimmick. In Yiddish we could say this was just John's shtick. He was just wasting people's time water baptizing people who are already forgiven. All they needed was to complete a sacrifice at the temple and go home. That was the old covenant, still in place. Jesus instructed his disciples to water baptize. Did the disciples water baptize for the remission of sins? Was John's baptism greater than the water baptism of Jesus? Let's ask one of his disciples. Hey, Peter, did you guys baptize for the remission of sins? Acts chapter 2 verse 38 then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Thanks, bro, Pete. Sometimes all you have to do is ask. When you accept Scripture plainly, things are simple to understand. The reason why John made water baptism so important is because it is important. It washed away sins when done properly, meaning with someone who has repented and confessed sins, then God operates through the water. Otherwise, 
John was a cheap salesman, using a gimmick to draw attention to himself. If water baptism does nothing, and that is all it is, it's just God making us do some silly thing. I reject that. Baptism of repentance is for the remission of sins. That's what I believe. Next, Kerrigan goes to Luke chapter 24, verses 46 and 47, then points out, See, baptism is not even mentioned here, as if he made some big point. That is horrible hermeneutics. We don't find verses that is missing a word to use as justification to ignore other verses where that word is included. That is horrible teaching. So Kerrigan says that in his opinion, which we are just supposed to accept as God's law, this one verse proves baptism is not required for the remission of sins. Are you going to accept this man's opinion as the law of God? I am not. I can do the same thing with the word repentance. Matthew chapter 26 verses 27 and 28. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Would you look at that? We see remission of sins and repentance is nowhere in sight. I suppose we can now ignore all other places that include repentance, since Jesus didn't seem to think it was important enough to include here. According to Kerrigan, if it was so important, it should be in every single occurrence. We can all make our own opinion as God's law and say this proves that repentance is not required for the remission of sins. Of course, Kerrigan won't agree to that. He has his double standard. I'm not allowed to treat the word repentance the same way he wants to treat the word baptism. How convenient that is. All to preserve Kerrigan's dogmatic view. That's not how it works, Kerrigan. Whatever study rules you create must be equal in all cases. We are not to use an unequal measure when handling Scripture. Instead of using this Bible math of subtraction, and exclusion, as Kerrigan is doing, as well as most of the modern church. I'm not just picking on Kerrigan. He is just following what they taught him. I am pointing out the flaws of most of the visible church. This is a product of Reformed theology. Imagine in your mind a road. I will call it the road of truth. On each side is a ditch. The left is the Roman Catholic ditch, and the right is the Reformation ditch. Do you want to be in the ditch or on the road of truth? You decide. Kerrigan continues in the same error for Acts chapter 5. I again can do this with repentance. Luke chapter 1 verses 77 and 78. To give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God whereby the dayspring from on high hath visited us. Here we see remission of sins, without repentance anywhere in sight. Wow, what does that prove, in Kerrigan's opinion? If held to be consistent, should say it proves repentance is not needed. All we need is God's mercy. This is ridiculous, because Kerrigan's whole approach is ridiculous. It amazes me how blind he really at time marker 20 minutes and 40 seconds. Kerrigan makes a silly rule. He says, and I quote, If it is that important that it remits and forgives sin, it should be mentioned every single time. End quote. That is just a ridiculous rule of study. I have shown two places so far where repentance was not included. With remission of sins. If we follow this rule Kerrigan has created, I could also mention Acts chapter 10 verse 43, also Romans chapter 3 verse 25. No repentance in these places. Then we must also negate repentance. Oh no. Okay, uh, we've had a problem here. This is Houston, say again, please. Yes, sir. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. When you look at all the places where remission of sins is located. 
there is not one single criteria listed consistently in every single place. That would mean nothing is for the remission of sins. Since we cannot find the single common thread that exists in every single reference, this rule implodes under the light of truth. There isn't any single thing listed consistently. In every occurrence, his rule is utter foolishness. Kerrigan goes to Matthew chapter 21 verses 23 through 27. I agree with Kerrigan that John's baptism is from heaven, it is from God. We reached a stone in his pond of despond, we can both stand on. I love it when we can agree, this is like an oasis, in an otherwise barren wasteland. Please allow me to enjoy the moment. Water baptism is from God, and instituted first through John the Baptizer. It did not come from ceremonial practices, popular among the Jews of that day. God instituted it through John who was preparing the way for Jesus. I agree on this very good point. Kerrigan even says baptism wasn't merely ritual. Although, he treats it just as if that all it actually is. Some empty ritual we are simply commanded to do. I believe God has an actual purpose for it, and not just some non-functioning appendage to our faith. God operates remission of sins through it. I also agree that the baptism of Jesus is greater than the baptism of John. Although, Kerrigan ignores the water baptism of Jesus, and only wants to focus on the Holy Spirit baptism of Jesus, then equates the baptism of the Holy Spirit with being born again. I really do not want to get into the topic of Holy Spirit baptism. I was hoping to just focus on water baptism. I cannot seem to avoid it. Since Kerrigan keeps bringing it up, he is wrong on this topic as well. He keeps making these rules for the rest of us to follow, saying that because there was a transition from the Old Covenant, to the new covenant. We should just ignore all these things, since they were only for that time, and do not happen anymore. I am beginning to detect a pattern. I would think he's a cessationist, meaning that the Holy Spirit gifts were only for that time, and when the perfect was come, meaning the completion of the Bible, then all the gifts of the Spirit ceased. These are the same arguments that cessationists make. Last I know about. Kerrigan is not a full-blown cessationist. I would say he is only half cessationist. He negates the Holy Spirit baptism as an event subsequent from salvation, but then accepts the Holy Spirit gifts could still happen today, even though he really hasn't experienced the gifts. Listed in 1 Corinthians chapters 12 through 14 personally? As far as I am aware, there does seem to be a little redefinition of the gifts, which allows him to think he has experienced some of them. Yet, I do not believe he really has. It's hard to exercise gifts which require an experience. You have never had. You cannot receive and operate in those gifts unless you have been filled with the Holy Spirit to overflowing. Like I said, it is a whole other topic, a much larger topic than water baptism. If I were to focus on that, I would need to make two or three times more videos. I have other videos on my channel. Feel free to check them out. For the sake of doing this series in a reasonable way, I must at this point, digress. I will say all these transition rules that Kerrigan is making are all designed to ignore passages and verses in the Bible, of which Kerrigan doesn't know how to deal with. None of his beliefs fit with them. So he uses these rules of transition to dispense with having to deal with the scripture. The problem is we have epistles which were written many years after the church had begun. None. Of. Them. Even mentions a rule of transition. 
that we ought to use to ignore how the church began. There aren't retractions given in scripture itself. Kerrigan expects the hearer, just take his word on it. Not only that, as he alluded to, the anti nice writing of the early church, which definitely came much later, they did not issue retractions or make these transition rules either. They seem to have believed the same things that took place in the book of Acts were still taking place in their lives. Of course, their writings are not scripture, although they were commenting on scripture and also writing down historical events. We can't base doctrine on them, but we can see how they were taught, some being directly taught by the original apostles. I would likely consider their views a bit more than someone living today, as long as it truly aligns with scripture. Were they wrong on things? Yes, many of them were wrong. The error increased the further down the timeline you go. The more time away from the beginning, errors began to appear. What should that tell you about us? We are extremely far from the beginning. This is why we must never accept the opinion of any man as God's word. Sadly, Kerrigan issues many opinions. I wish he would just allow the Bible to be understood plainly and at face value. If you want me to believe anything concerning faith, you need to show me God's word, without all the song and dance, without all the opinions, also without all the made-up rules, also without trying to use one part to cancel out other parts, also without using small connective words to redefine and change the direction of a verse. Stop playing all the games and give it to me straight. That's what I expect, and I what I do my best to do for others. At time marker 32 minutes and 48 seconds, Kerrigan says that just because John the Baptist did not mention water baptism when speaking of Jesus and salvation, that means we can all just ignore all the verses that do talk about it. Okay, Houston, uh, we've had a problem here. This is Houston, say again, please. Yes, sir. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. The same error he keeps making. There are plenty of places where someone leaves out one or more of the requirements for salvation. That does not mean we can just cast out all the places that do mention them. This is really becoming a dead horse. I have already shown how ridiculous this logic is. My hope is that by now, you are equipped to recognize these errors that he keeps repeating. Also that it might help you to see the error other teachers make. That his video series helps you to properly discern when someone is being true and faithful to scripture and someone that is not. Let's say I use this same tactic to negate holiness. Would that mean holiness is not required? Say I want to prove Jesus isn't God. Maybe I could use these tactics to make myself God. That is why I am pointing these things out. Depending on what these tactics are used, very dangerous outcomes are possible. I personally know that. Kerrigan has come against this type of logic in the past, which is why I am so shocked to see him doing the same thing. Looking for ways to subtract scripture is not the right way. We ought not to find reasons to exclude. We need to see ways to include. Scripture is additive, not subtractive. God did not make erroneous entries that need to be deleted by us. He offered his word. Here a little, and there a little. Then we are supposed to add it all up, not the other way around. Atheists use this same tactic that Kerrigan is using to attempt to discount the Gospels, saying, look, this one says this many people were there, and that one disagrees. Therefore we can throw out the whole thing, sadly, and tragically. Kerrigan is following this same crazy pattern on the topic of water baptism, 
oh I pray. His eyes might be opened. Kerrigan gives his double standard at time marker 33 minutes and 8 seconds, saying faith and repentance are two sides of the same coin. Have you noticed all these rules are favorable to his own position? I can do the same thing. Since repentance and baptism are listed together so many times, I have a water baptism and repentance coin in my pocket. He wouldn't let me do that. I am not allowed to appropriate his made-up rules. To favor my position, we must only use Kerrigan's rules to favor Kerrigan's position. Reality simply doesn't work that way. If he can use his atheist cancellation of scripture tactic to support his view, the atheist should be able to use it for their view. I should be granted the same tactic to support my view. Not that I would want to, or need to. I reject the entire idea. It's not valid for me, or Kerrigan, or the atheists. It is seriously flawed logic. And a horrible way to deal with scripture. It is painful to watch this series. He keeps repeating the same errors, over, and over, and over again. I just hope I have done enough of a good job pointing it out so that everyone out there that hears this response video can be equipped to spot these errors if I achieve that. Praise God! Don't fall into the traps these errors produce. There are enough verses that pair repentance and water baptism together for the remission of sins for us to believe simply what it says. Kerrigan said at the beginning of the first video, that he would only show the clear and plain understanding of scripture. Everything he has done shows quite the opposite. I don't think he is malicious. I believe he believes his own teaching, even with the errors all through it. He just has a serious blindness. He talks briefly saying Jesus himself did not baptize anyone, which is not any kind of a point. He instructed his disciples. They baptized under his instruction and in his name. Maybe Jesus didn't baptize because he would have had to baptize in his own name. Maybe Jesus knew some might become prideful and say, I am baptized by the master himself. This type of behavior has actually happened. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 Verses 12 through 17. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and one of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you, but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name and I baptized also the household of Stephanus, besides. I know not whether I baptized any other, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. The purpose of what Paul was saying was not to say water baptism isn't necessary. He was speaking against the pride some of them were having. Baptism doesn't make the cross of no effect. Pride does that. So maybe that is why Jesus didn't baptize. I don't know. All we can do is guess. It is a trivial thing and doesn't prove or disprove anything. Again Kerrigan throws another rule on the wood pile to be burned. You cannot be baptized unless you are a disciple first. Funny. I can say you cannot become a disciple until you are water baptized with repentance. Games, games, games. Another silly rule to be ignored. Do you realize how short this video would be if you deleted all his errors, opinions, and rules? I am not going to take the time to figure it out. It would be a fairly short video, I would guess, when he begins his talk on what it means to be saved. I do have a general agreement with Kerrigan. On the three types of salvation. I just use biblical terms. Born again. This is what Kerrigan calls initial salvation. I simply call it getting born again or converted. That is the birth into spiritual life. New converts are referred to as babes in Christ. 
1 Peter chapter 2 verse 1. Wherefore laying aside all malice, and all guile, and hypocrisies, and envies, and all evil speakings, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. After you are born again, just as a baby grows, and matures, we also mature in the faith, through sanctification, this is the betrothal stage, also known as the rest of our lives. We are currently betrothed, the wedding day has not happened yet, Kerrigan calls this probation. Matthew chapter 22, verses 9 through 14. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways, and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Then of course, when we die, our race is finished. Our fight is over, we will see that wedding day, the final judgment. Kerrigan calls this final salvation. Quick summary, born again, or born of the Spirit. Then the betrothal period, and finally, the wedding day, the three basic types of salvation. We basically agree on this, yay, another chance to agree. Well, wonders never cease. Another stone in the pond of despond, we can both stand on. Praise Jesus. As far as he was discussing salvation, apart from baptism, I can say I agree with most of the rest of the teaching. At time marker 1 hour, 1 minute, and 40 seconds, he says that baptism is a good work, that it is required for the probationary period as obedience, but not initial salvation. Then he asks a question. Quote, how is it not works-based salvation? If water baptism is required for initial salvation, end quote. Okay, that's an easy one. I am not making the water wash away my sins. God is doing that. The operation of remission of sins is actively operated by God. I have no power to make the water do that. So salvation is not based on my works. It is God's work. What about the actions of doing the water baptism? You might as well ask the same thing about repentance. Don't you pray and ask for repentance? Isn't the action of prayer a good work? Is the action of praying the works your salvation is based upon? No, of course not. It's a bad argument. Kerrigan has repeatedly fought against hypergrace antinomians. That say repentance is works-based. Why does he use their same flawed argument? Are you that desperate to grasp at straws? God does all the work for salvation. We cannot bring about our own salvation on our own. We must have Jesus. Both sides of this topic ought to agree on that. The water by itself does nothing for salvation. A proper water baptism is relying on the blood of Jesus through faith and repentance, both blood and water. Otherwise, it is not a real baptism. You just have a wet sinner. I will also add this. They believe water baptism is required as obedience for what they call probation salvation and final salvation. If you call it a work, then you have the same dilemma. Salvation is salvation. It does not matter which stage you applied it to. You too would be guilty of works-based salvation. For your work of obedience, there is no difference, besides all that. Work salvation is not described in the Bible as actual tasks you perform. It is defined as trying to use the law of Moses for salvation. Let's take a look. Galatians chapter 2 verse 16 Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. The works-based salvation they were going against was new Christian Pharisees were going around telling Gentiles they needed to be saved by following the works of the law of Moses. As Christians we are told to be doers of good works, those good works are not keeping the law of Moses for salvation, 
they are evidence of Christ within us. It is just a really bad argument, another one on the woodpile. To be burned, water baptism is not added by men. It is simply already included in God's word, ordained by God, instituted through John the baptizer, making the way for Jesus, taught to the disciples by Jesus, continued into the new covenant church. We simply recognize that truth. Kerrigan goes to Colossians 1:13 and 14. Then says we all have this testimony without water baptism that none of them have this testimony with water baptism. What testimony is he talking about? Did he stop sinning and never sin again? What is this darkness into light in his mind? Is he saying that was instant when he was a babe in Christ? He himself said he knew nothing as a new convert. And also that he has sinned since conversion. Brand new converts are still a bit rough around the edges. They have no discipline as Christians. In many cases, we still have some bad habits. Yes, we are forgiven of past sins. What if we slip up as a new convert and let out a cuss word? Or two. That's right, we must repent. Better than that, we must learn to not do it again. So there is initial sanctification. And there is ongoing sanctification through discipleship. Colossians 1 does not describe the brand new convert. It describes conversion and ongoing sanctification to move from darkness unto light. We weren't built in a moment or a day. Some were built up in the faith over many years. That is the purpose of the probationary period. Or what I call the betrothal period. I'm not sure what experience Kerrigan thinks. Remission of sins produces. Does he think it is goosebumps, some feeling or something? What does he think it should do, that we should notice? Scripture doesn't tell us that remission of sins comes with some sort of feeling. Sins are not physical, so we ought not expect removal of sins. Would produce a physical response. I know many of us experience a lifting of a weight. That isn't caused by the remission of sins. That is caused by our own relief, that we have a clean record. I get a very similar feeling when I pay off a long-standing debt. I feel so relieved knowing I am finally free from it. That is not spiritual, it is emotional. I have seen many people who were joyful and emotional following their water baptism. Great for them. I had my own feelings following my water baptism. Great, the point is. The Bible does not tell us we will experience a certain feeling when sins are remitted. It is another one on the burn pile. Kerrigan also claims water baptism is not in the letters of the Bible, he is so blind. Romans chapter 6 verse 4 Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so we also should walk in newness of life. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 5 One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Colossians chapter 2 verse 12 Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. 1 Peter chapter 3 verses 20 and 21 Which sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a-preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Then Kerrigan says water cannot wash away sins. Because it is physical. Is blood physical? Why does he believe blood, which is physical, can do something water cannot do? I agree water by itself cannot wash away sins. God is performing the operation through the water. If coupled with faith and repentance, is Kerrigan saying God is not allowed to work through his creation? The fact that Jesus came to save us from sin involved him to work through his creation. He became a man in human flesh. That is the best example of spiritual working through the natural. The teaching is over. I decided to sit and listen to the question and answer session. I was told I should do that. The first person on the microphone says if someone falls away, they need to get re-baptized. No, that is not correct. This assumes the initial salvation was real. So it is the same as being born again, again. When people come back to the faith, they are not born again. 
Again, they are simply restored. The only time someone would need another water baptism is if they were a false convert. In truth, the first quote, unquote, baptism was not a real baptism since they did not have genuine faith and repentance. They were just a wet sinner. Every person only really needs one real water baptism. Just as we are only born again one time. After that none is needed. They are simply restored. To say we believe we need to keep getting water baptized. Every time we sin is a straw man argument. It only shows you do not really understand the position at all. Do you get born again every time you sin? No, of course not. It's the same thing. Of course, Kerrigan agreed with his wrong point and said it is coming in future teaching, which means I will need to address it again. I don't fault the person on the microphone. He is just asking the question, trying to reason it out in his own head. It's clear he isn't sure about it. I do fault Kerrigan. He ought to know better. He had in the past been so good to know the opposing view from their own standpoint, then critique it from the inside. He has not even bothered to do that on this topic. Kerrigan did not put in the required work. He ought to know better. Blindness. At time marker 1 hour, 14 minutes, and 36 seconds. The person on the microphone says it is heretical. And another gospel to believe water baptism and repentance is for the remission of sins. Then Kerrigan said amen. Okay, oh, yeah, we've had a problem here. This is Houston, say again, please. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. This is a serious charge. This would mean they think myself. And why city fellowship are cursed and condemned, yet they still call us brother and sister. Strange indeed. If they are listening to this video I am making, I would exhort you to change your view on that. I could just as easy say those who don't believe that baptism and repentance is for the remission of sins are heretical and preaching a false gospel, especially since the only group during the time of the early church that did not believe water baptism and repentance is for the remission of sins were the Gnostics, who were a group of heretics preaching a false gospel. That is simple church historical fact. Since Kerrigan's fellowship do baptize, I believe God does the operation for the remission of sins, even if they don't acknowledge it. God does not rely upon our acknowledgement to do His will. It is not a false gospel. To simply believe the plain understanding of Scripture, I am extending grace unto your error. Consider doing the same for us. We believe God is the source for salvation. How is that heresy? How is that a false gospel? Please reconsider your accusation. We have been grilled by saying we are not allowed any exceptions. The gospel has no exceptions. It does not change. If you have even one exception, it cannot be true. That is what we have been told. Then at time marker 1 hour, 15 minutes, and 5 seconds. Kerrigan refers to the disciples of John. Then he says, what would have happened to them? If Paul never met up with them, and they died in that state, would they be saved? Yes, he says. Of course they would be saved. He says, God judges them for the knowledge they had. That is what Kerrigan said really. Saved without being born again. When Paul found out they were only disciples of John, he quickly points out that John's baptism was for remission of sins, but it was not good enough for salvation. They needed the water baptism of Jesus. At this point, the old covenant was already long passed away. So Jesus was their only hope. If they died without Jesus, are they saved? Kerrigan says yes. Wow! Are you crazy? Talk about an exception. He says they don't really need Jesus to be saved. The better answer is to say no. They would have been condemned. Although, that is just a scenario. Scenarios do not make truth. They often portray conditions that never happen. I also believe God is the God of mercy. If he sees those searching and wanting to be saved, he makes a way for them to receive the gospel. So the fact is, God led Paul to where they would be. That was not some random accidental meeting. It was a divine appointment. They did hear Paul and believe. They were then born again. Which included water baptism. Crazy scenarios don't prove anything. We don't live in the world of what if, 
We live in the world of what is, not what might theoretically happen. We live in the world of what actually did happen. I think the exception of ignorance Kerrigan is referring to applies to those incapable of understanding their conscience. They really don't know right from wrong, which would be mentally handicapped people and small children. Adults do know right from wrong and are accountable to that. Ultimately, God judges. I just cannot agree with Kerrigan's exception. Based upon scripture, I suppose our exceptions are now acceptable. No double standard. Right. At time marker 1 hour, 16 minutes, and 32 seconds. Kerrigan says he has turned down people for baptisms. How is that biblical? Even by their view. Baptism is a command. This makes it required. If someone cannot get baptized, we really should do what we can to help them get baptized. Even if all we believe it is, is a command. Jesus thought it was important enough to command it. Shouldn't we, at least on that basis, want to carry that command out? His main point seems to be that we don't depend upon man. That is half true. I agree that God can still save someone without another human being present. Yet, we do rely on men to be saved, in the sense of the preaching of the gospel. Romans chapter 10 verses 13 through 15. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace! and bring glad tidings of good things. There you have it. Someone needs to be sent, so they can preach, so they can hear. So they can believe, so they can know who to call upon. So they can be saved. So man is actually involved in the process. Of course, after someone has heard the gospel, they can be saved with no person currently present. At some other location or time, after hearing the gospel. Even from their view of obedience, they ought to think it's important to tell them if they believe and repent they should seek to be baptized somewhere. That is why follow-up contact is important, if possible. Kerrigan also mentioned it is hard to find a biblical church to get baptized in. What does he mean by that? Is baptism somehow less valid because it happened in a church that has some wrong doctrines? Must their statement of faith mirror your own to be qualified to do baptisms? I was baptized in a Southern Baptist church. Do you know what made my baptism real? It wasn't the Southern Baptist Convention. They are wrong on so many doctrines. What made it valid was my faith and repentance and a desire to do God's will to get baptized. All the person baptizing needs to do is baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Many Baptist churches can do that. Also if you pick a smaller church with less people, you have a better chance of getting one that has some real Christians in it, a church that believes repentance of sin is required. Sure that's not ideal, but it will do just fine. So places do exist, if you look just a few steps past your dogma. Brother Kevin gets on the microphone and makes very good points. We do need to fear God and be mindful not to teach false doctrine. There is a stricter judgment, a more severe condemnation, I believe that is why it is so incredibly important to accept scripture at face value as much as possible. The more you play with scripture, the more you risk. I believe this admonishment from Kevin can easily be applied to Kerrigan, given all the errors he has been making. Brother Kevin also makes a sound point about the baptism of fire, referring to judgment of unrepentant sinners. When you read the passage he is referring to, that makes the most sense with the flow of what is being said. I know people who do believe in subsequent Holy Spirit baptism. Try to use this passage to say the Holy Spirit baptism is that baptism of fire. I believe that is error. I would point out, you don't need to use that passage anyway. There is another verse you can use instead. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 29 For our God is a consuming fire. We really went through a lot on this video. I have peeked at some of the upcoming videos. I am not going to go over all of it. 
namely his view of Holy Spirit baptism. It is just too much to tackle two topics in one series. I have other videos on my channel on that topic. You can review them if you want. I am only focusing on water baptism. I really hope you can see my sincerity. I still actually care about Kerrigan and those I have come to know well at their fellowship. I can also say everyone here at Y City Fellowship can say the same thing about those they know. This really hits close to home with us. I do this to stand for truth in a very loving, caring, and accurate way. I am not seeking to misrepresent anyone. I am giving it straight from their own view, even though the same has not been extended to us. This is personal. Yet this is not about personal vindication. This is about truth and to say, Come let us reason together, not to call names, set up boundaries, and then devour each other. Galatians chapter 5 verses 14 through 16 For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, but if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If things are being said about us to others, I accept that as expected. Sad enough, the church today has become a type of spiritual MMA, ultimate octagon fighting event. This ought not to be. So if you don't get what I am saying, fine. I do ask that you at least see our hearts are not full of malice, but full of concern. Please let that be the minimum take away, if nothing else. This concludes this video. May God bless you as you seek His face.